Well, hey, everyone. Welcome into another episode of The Winsome Creationist. I have uh, my new friend, Zach, here. Uh, we've been talking for a few minutes, and I think we're going to become fast friends. And at the very least, we're nerdy about a lot of the same stuff. And so that's really fun and, and really cool. Um, so this is one of, um, again, one, one of the first uh, interviews that I've gotten to do on The Winsome Creationist, which has been, you know, my goal is to have good conversations with other people who believe that we ought to be, number one, you know, winsome creationists. But then also, eventually, I'd like to have some people who, you know, maybe don't necessarily have that as a goal or, or either, um, you know, they, they maybe would fall outside of the category of, of uh, you know, of being a winsome creationist and have them on too. And let's talk about it. And let's figure out, you know, where the agreement is and where the disagreement is. So the more we can do of this, the better. So I'm just thrilled and and blessed to have Zach on with me, and I'm going to let him take it away and just kind of share a little bit about himself. And we're going to talk about how to be an informed young age creationist and what it even is to be an informed creationist and, and why and all kinds of good stuff. So Zach, take it away, my friend. Well, thank you, Steve. It's great to be with you. I've enjoyed the podcast uh, up until now, and I'm kind of blown away, actually, that you have me on here. I feel oh. like there's... Much, much bigger fish you could have gone for, but I'm, I'm oh, delighted please. to have this conversation with you. This is great. Um, as far as my background, so uh, I think like you, I'm, I'm not a professional uh, academic or someone involved uh, day to day in science. I, I, I work as a software engineer, software architect uh, is my day job, uh, which it's good work. I work from home, which is uh, nice. I, I have a lot of flexibility, so I'm very grateful for it. Uh, but I kind of think of myself as bivocational uh, because my my passion and my interest really is more in the area of creation. Um, initially, in more of the creation apologetics and more of a, a kind of a, a you know, I'd say an apologetic evangelistic kind of understanding of creation. And then over the past few years, uh, becoming more interested in the actual process of creation research and how these creationist ideas uh, come about, where they come from, who's doing what. Um, the fact that creationists have different ideas, which, you know, someone raised in in creation circles you mostly hear a lot of the same uh ideas being repeated and then you discover somebody disagrees and it's kind of mind-blowing there's there's diversity in thought in creationism and you have a bit of a crisis of faith maybe um and that kind of leads into my into this topic because as i began to get more into the into the uh, creationist community learn what some of the different positions and ideas out there and and having to navigate this, I, I joined the board of the Missouri Association for Creation, which is a local uh, popular creationist apologetics group uh, based out of St. Louis, Missouri, where I live. And I do speaking for them. I do field trips and other things, a little bit of writing. And, you know, we're, we're all, for the most part, like myself, you know, we have day jobs and then we do this because this is our passion. This is what we're really excited about. And most of us, while we may have some technical expertise, uh, it's not often a lot of crossover with uh, the, the, the creation science world. And so um, as you're coming into that and trying to be able to be an effective advocate for creationism, uh, be able to present it in a in a, a winsome fashion, but in an accurate fashion and so forth, uh, I started thinking about, well, wh what is this sort of middle tier, you might say, between uh, the, the, you know, we'll just say the average person, you know, in church uh, or in the pew, as you might say, who maybe they're inclined towards creation, but they really don't have time or inclination to study it deeply. They just, you know, they believe what the Bible says. They believe it because their pastor teaches it, perhaps, or because a, a ministry they respect. And then, of course, you have the people that are at the, at the uh, academic level, those who are scientists and scholars or those who work for creationist organizations full time. And then you've got these people, uh, maybe like yourself and certainly myself, who are kind of in that middle tier where uh, we really are, uh, engaged and passionate about this area. And in some ways, I think we, we have the uh, potential to serve as sort of um, a force multiplier, right? Of being able to get information yeah. uh, out to people. But to do that requires us to do some legwork and to kind of know what it is we're talking about, not at the scientific academic level, perhaps, but enough that we're actually, you know, giving people accurate information and hopefully information that reflects where the the, the creationist community is actually going um, on a certain area. And, and again, that's going to apply whether you're talking about it in an apologetic situations, so you're dealing with unbelievers or skeptics, or if you're talking to people at church or in a Christian educational environment and you're, you're relaying information about geology and paleontology and astronomy and so forth, you know, we're, we're kind of in a position almost like uh, science journalists. Uh, and, and that's kind of a, a big red flag right away because science journalism, as I might mention as we get to this conversation, 
is kind of a minefield. Um, the headlines often do not reflect what the paper actually said. And mm -hmm. so that's an area where I think we have to be careful because we can do that. We can be that, that we, we can sometimes uh, maybe uh, read something too hastily or jump to a conclusion. And there's people who will take our word more or less as gospel and run with it. And now they're going to repeat it to their friends and their, you know, uh, fellow students and so forth. And we could be setting up people for, you know, potential uh, failure, uh, frankly, if we're not careful with uh, how we articulate and how we communicate um, the things that we're learning, that we're excited about, and we ought to be excited about them. It's great. Um, but that's where this idea of an informed creationist, uh, this kind of category, I've been mulling this over and kind of organizing my thoughts about it because I do think it's, there's a real need for it. Um, not everyone is going to be, have the wherewithal or just the, the opportunity in life or just, just not their calling to go into full-time academic uh, research or, or speaking and so forth. There's a lot more folks like myself who are excited about it and who want to help uh, share that message, share that information. Um, but how can we do it in a way that's actually faithful to scripture, that's faithful to the science, and uh, that actually is a genuine help to people that points them in the right direction for further information and so forth. And that, and that also avoids developing maybe an unhealthy dependency on certain, certain ideas and certain, um, um, you know, uh, messages in creation that made them popular at one point. And now you've got people who, you know, their, their whole faith in creation is hinging on maybe an outdated theory. Like, how do we not do that? How do we not, yeah. how do we learn from our mistakes in the past and get people to understand what creation science is actually about and what's going on and why it's exciting, why it's compelling, uh, but not develop an unhealthy dependency on, on, on it, on these specific scientific statements and ideas that might be uh, currently, you know, popular in, in our community. And, you know, there, there's, there's two, two things I just want to emphasize here. One, as I've already referenced, you know, we can cause others to stumble if we're not careful, right? We can set people up thinking they have a really good uh, argument for creation or against evolution. And then they meet somebody who knows a little bit more. And now that's overturned. And, you know, some of our most uh, vociferous anti-creationist foes, um, and I'm saying that, you know, because they, they, they emphasize, you know, they're, they're really against creationists, right? They have a, maybe a bit of an ax to grind against us. A surprising number of them are former young earthers. And I think there's something to be said there. There's a, a warning for us there because people genuinely feel misled and hurt and they're embarrassed because they built their faith on something that ended up not being trustworthy. And so we need to be aware of, of that just as a, uh, you might say, a tactical matter. And then more importantly, God's just not honored when we do that. Um, God's a God of truth. And if we're trying to support God's word using arguments that aren't true, uh, there's a big disconnect there. Uh, and it's not actually honoring to God when we use arguments that are fallacious or that are outdated. Um, obviously, you know, the Lord sees our hearts. And if it's a genuine, if we all are going to make mistakes. There's no way to avoid that. Uh, but if we are going to take on that responsibility of being communicators of technical information and try to bring it down to folks, then we need to take with that. We have that. There's a measure of responsibility that's incumbent on us to make sure we are informed, that we are communicating to the best of our ability, knowing that we're going to make mistakes, uh, to the best of our ability, accurate information about scientific issues. And then lastly, just communicating in a way that does not build unhealthy dependency on ourselves, on particular scientific ideas, but rather that turns people ultimately to, to the Lord, to, to God's word, to him as being the source of what's uh, of absolute truth that you can build your faith on, that you can build your life on, um, and not a really compelling creation scientific theory. Yeah. Yeah, I love this already. I'm telling you, Zach, if, 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 if literally we were to cut the conversation off here, I would have been helped because let me tell you, there is, I've always kind of wondered where, like, what am I doing? with my life here, <laughs> you know, in a sense, you know, um, when I, when I, and I'll say, uh, something about, about the, the content of what you just said in a moment, but I just want to underscore this, you know, when I first started a creation podcast in 2017, um, honestly, the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes I made, which I, you know, only to a certain degree, do I believe in the concept of regret? Um, but if I can say I, that I made a mistake, um, I definitely did, I think, make a mistake when I left the niche of creation in, in my podcast and, um, and uh, just kind of went to something more general. Um, 
because as a, when you're in creation, you can talk about so much other stuff anyway, like it would have been fine. Anyway, I started back in 2017 just with this idea of like, you know, probably I'm never going to be like, you know, an answer to Genesis or whatever. Like, and that's fine. But I said, you know, also, I'm not just kind of like a, you know, a, a Johnny in the in the pew who's like, who only has one question either. I'm like, I'm kind of interested in this. I kind of want to know more. And I kind of want to help other people see why it's important and help them learn more a, a, as well. And I have, of course, in that sense, always viewed myself as some sort of a popularizer. I think that's a word that is, is descriptive. But I love the idea of sort of this third tier of like, you know what, this there is a, a growing number of people. Um, the more, again, people get on the Internet. I mean, I remember when like if I were to have put on a webinar about something creation related in 2017 or 2018, I would have been doing something revolutionary for the creation community. Now, since then, there's been a few attempts at that from some of the bigger groups. And honestly, I could probably still do it, you know, and it would still be kind of new because of how slowly technology, you know, adoption kind of happens in the uh, Christian community writ large. But, um, um, which is ironic, historically speaking. Anyway, that's a rabbit trail. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice to know and be able to talk with somebody who can so well articulate sort of what it is to be in this in this third uh, tier of people. And I, you know, I completely agree because you do have people who seem to be stuck on, you know, whatever, just one, the easy example to, to cherry pick out is just, you know, the idea of there being some sort of, you know, vapor canopy or ice canopy, you know, associated in, uh, in Genesis 1. Um, man, people just just hang on to that idea. Another one, and um, I know there are some, you know, proponents of it, you know, today, and that's fine. But another one that's like this was the hydroplate theory, Walt Brown. You know, that was pretty big back in the day and stuff. And, you know, now that's mostly gone out of uh, fashion. And again, there's some people who still hold to it, but it's mostly gone out of fashion. And you just you just have people who who do weirdly like tie everything they teach back to like this one model being right. And I'll just, you know, kind of sadly, like we see this happening with another big creationist organization right now where they're sort of planting the flag on particular models of speciation and, and, and things like this. And I'm like, isn't this the same mistake that like we criticize the church of days gone by for or, or even that we, we criticize modern day evolutionists for? And when I say we, I'm speaking writ large, the creation community, yep. you know, we, we criticize evolutionists for tying scientific models and, and, and like for holding those to be the standard bearer of truth and that we have to mold everything else to fit that um and 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 shutting out you know them in terms of like them being open to the scientific ideas that we have but then we we turn around in the creation community and do the same thing and you kind of have this small group which i am pleased to identify with at some level even though i'm not a scientist or even a theologian or whatever but you do sort of have this small group of people who's just always open to the next discovery, you know, who's always opening the door, always peering under the next rock and, and, and uh, looks at that, whatever's behind the door or, or whatever is under the rock, not with this just an epic degree of skepticality, but instead looks at it with an open mind and says, gosh, I wonder how this cool thing fits in to God's bigger picture and, and the larger story that God is telling. And uh, man, that that's just a huge, like, I want to be associated with people who think that way because it's, it's so freeing to think that any, every new discovery, you know, it's like, it's like, I'm, I'm ranting now. I'm sorry, but I, I do. Great. I just, I just feel like, I just feel like some creationists are, are scared to death of the next headline that comes out. Um, or are just if maybe scared to death is the wrong way to put it. They're just immediately skeptical of it. Like, oh, this headline is obviously wrong. Obviously wrong. And it's like, well, maybe it's not. Um, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's just not. Maybe there's a larger way that this integrates. And so really appreciate that. And I think, I think if you are going to especially have that kind of mindset, then yeah, being informed is a huge piece of the puzzle. Like you, you can't, if you if you stay out of the loop with things as fast as technology moves and as, as fast as you know books come out and papers come out and and all of that like now now I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this too and I, we'll probably talk about this as we go on so 
Um, if that's the case, please feel free to um, just go um, in whatever order you, you feel necessary. But I do want to talk about this, um, about this idea of like how specific do we need to get versus, you know, what are the more general ideas? For example, you know, I was reading a paper earlier today that was like this super specific thing about this species that was found to have burrowed and everything. And it was like had implications for the post-flood versus pre-flood boundary. And I'm like, Johnny in the pew probably doesn't care about this. Um, I might care about it a little bit because I'm interested in the topic, but like, you know, to what degree do we need to, to be getting into the specifics versus just being able to answer the apologetics questions or go into the theology questions? And if you have any thoughts on that, I'd, I'd definitely be curious to hear them. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. And I, I think something that we have to think about a lot, uh, you know, it's, it depends your, your audience and who you are communicating to, you know, that's going to make, have a big role to play in deciding, okay, is this actually something that's relevant or is this legitimately just going to be confusing and maybe even unsettling for no real benefit? Now, in an apologetic sense, uh, setting, right, where you're trying to make a, a positive case for creation, right? Um, and and even in, a, uh, in maybe a church setting where you're teaching people who are already convinced of creation, you're trying to you know, broaden their views a little bit, there can be a use for those things. For one thing, it shows that creationism is a working scientific paradigm. Um, if it's not, then you, it, it, if it's not a scientific paradigm and it is just basically set in stone, uh, then, well, the rules are quite a bit different. And I think that it leads us into some really problematic areas because science, as maybe we'll talk about later, fundamentally, it's a human activity. And so it bears with it all of the the good and bad of being human in that sense. and And so... Uh, it's a yeah. problem, really, if we enshrine our scientific ideas. And so, you know, it can be helpful to say, OK, look, this creationist is writing about this discovery and coming to this conclusion. Other creationists might think something a little bit different. That's actually can be a healthy uh, example of creation research at work. That's what it's supposed to do. But again, that's not going to be relevant to every audience. And so I think that for a lot of those issues, what I try to do uh, when I'm speaking to a, a general audience, and I know these are not people that are really following creation science for, in, in particular, and I have to deal with something like the flood post flood boundary. And I will, because I'll show a, a geologic column, you know, a, a chart, and I'll talk about how a lot of creationists think that this stack of rocks probably represents the flood, and this is afterwards, and there's some fossil reasons for that, and other creationists disagree, and they, and they have uh, other ways of looking at these things. And what I like to do is I, I like to introduce just enough uncertainty so that, they rec so that folks recognize that is not something I should place my faith in, right? I love that. It's just, in, it's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not saying we have no clue. It's all up for grabs. And no, I, this is a really, this is a good model. This is probably where it is, but it's science. And as science, we should present it in a magisterial way. We should present it as this is where our knowledge has us right now. This lets us explain some things that I can, point to certain features of the, those rock layers and say, here's why we think they, they make sense as far as being posited by the flood and maybe other ones, maybe not so much. But the, the uncertainty there, I think, is healthy because it reminds people we're still dealing with science. And if we're dealing with science, then we're not dealing with absolute knowledge. And that's where I think the informed creationist outlook is so important is, is, is in separating those two ways of looking at at how we come to know truth, because the way we come to know truth when we look at scripture, if we believe in inerrancy or we believe that the Bible gives us, the Genesis gives us an accurate history of origins, right? Those are truths that we can hold as axiomatic. This is, this is true because it's been revealed to us. And I can give positive reasons for believing that, but it functions as an axiom. It functions as this governs my paradigm. Now I'm going to go do science under that paradigm. And the science is not, it's not endowed with the same characteristics that the Genesis count has, right? And so the Ge Genesis tells us that there was a catastrophic flood. It gives us some hints about maybe some of the tectonic things going on, but it doesn't give us a scientific model of the flood. And so now when you go to a model like catastrophic plate tectonics or hydroplate or some other flood model, and we present those with a healthy degree of uncertainty, because this is essentially, these scientists think this is the best way to understand this. And that should not be uh, presented or misunderstood as being on the level of 
what scripture reveals. And you mentioned the height yeah. of theory earlier, and I know why, because that's one of those particular models that a lot of the adherents, they have kind of attached a little bit too much magisterial yeah. status to it, to where it kind of becomes equated with scripture. And I think that just that put shows is it's a misunderstanding of what science actually is. And that's yeah. something that I think is really important for us to be clear on. Yeah, I, I don't think the past few years has been any help to us <laughs> in this regard either. I wrote down in my notes to bring up the science, right? In the sense that like science in our culture has started to become more popularly regarded as something that can give absolute truth. And so there's almost this, there's almost this uphill battle of, of, of education that has to happen to people in the pew who are placing their trust in science or and even teenagers who they hear one thing in church and then they go to school, but then in church, there's never a robust explanation of what's going on. It's just, well, God said it, that settles it kind of thing. And then, then they go to school and they hear something else. And in school, they're actually starting to hear, well, the science settles it. You know, the science that we're, we're following the science when it right. comes to these guidelines or just whatever. And, and it's so, it's so fascinating how like you can literally, especially with cultural, you know, things like that, where it's like, we're following the science, but then like legit in public, the science changed. Right. And, and, and you can actually see people still latching on to the old ideas. So, so this is not a problem unique to creationism not at all. but now, but now we have this new i think it's becoming worse though in the in the public sphere and so now we have this new educational battle of hey look so step 1 science is not something that can give absolute truth it, it is again it's something that that ministers to what we you know what we learn and and can glean from reading our bible but it can't magistrate over that because of the nature of the thing itself and so it's it's kind of a, a two step move that um, that needs to happen. Um, I'll invite any other thoughts that you have on that. But uh, after that, if you want to, just let's let's kind of hear more about like your idea of what an informed creationist is beyond what you've already said, and then why, like the why behind that. Why would yeah. why you know why do we need to do this? Yeah. So we've touched on a few points of those points already, and I'll just add to what you were saying a moment ago. Uh, we have two. We have sort of two ways we can go astray when we're dealing with this whole. Uh, the, the the specter, if you will, of science in our culture, because science, it does represent truth to the culture at large, right? That's why the phrase follow the science, even though things are kind of in a mess now on that front. But but it, even there, right, the reason why people uh, regarded that so highly and became so emotional over it is because it is essentially science has become a bit of a priesthood culturally. And so mm -hmm. what happens then is that Christians um, especially though, I've, and this is my observations, I've done like studies on this, but my observation that Christians will t go two different directions that I think are both an error here. One is to say, okay, science is actually bad. And we actually, you know, we, we distrust things when they come from scientists. I think that's a big mistake. And mm -hmm. I'll talk about it with that when we get into more of the informed creationist perspective. The other one though, that relates more to what we were talking about is we, we swap out the cultures science for our science and we still apply the same magisterial authority to creation science i mean you do that you can't just say you have to pick a maybe a creation scientist or maybe a creation scientific model because these things are always changing and you again you begin to attribute authority and a changelessness to your preferred branch of creation science and either of those approaches i think are are very flawed and and very dangerous really because they they misunderstand the nature of science and they, they really set you up, I'm afraid, for deception um, and not even intentional deception, but self-deceptions because you will, be, you will be blinded to what might actually be true because you've convinced yourself that my adherence to this model is on par with my personal faith and trust in God. And that's never healthy to apply that kind of faith and trust to any human authority, really. Um, and, and science in particular is a very poor one because of the nature of it's incredible how fragmented, fragmentary and always changing our scientific knowledge really is. Um, yeah. And I, I, let me just say, let me just say too, that I, you know, I get it. Like if, if somebody like given just even what I know about it, which is very little because I'm not a geologist, 
But like, I can imagine that it would be difficult to give up, say, catastrophic plate tectonics. Something else came along just because of, I mean, how convinced I am um, of like, yeah, sure has, seems to have a lot of evidence that this, you know, worked. Um, that this is how this is how it was done. And it's like if something were to come along and just totally dethrone that, I get it. I would be I would, you know, I would have a a time, you know, getting over that unless the evidence was purely overwhelming, you know. Um, but whereas something like the starlight issue is so up in the air, I'm kind of just right. like, please, if 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 anyone comes out with any kind of consensus on this issue, right. I'm I'm willing to take that one, you know, instead of what I currently think, you know? And um which not that that's something that we even need to focus on that much, but yeah, I mean, I kind of get the the sentiment of like of holding on to our holding on you know tightly to our to our models, but at the same time, like a true scientist, you know, just isn't really going to do that. Like somebody who's right. really concerned with scientific integrity is going to realize how important a change in the tides have has been, like in the history of science. Like science yeah. is built on science is built on change. It is. Um, and and so to hold on to anything with such a grasp is, you know, really seems mistaken. So, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, very good. So, um, let's let's talk about a little bit. I want to one of the points that that kind of we wrote down here as in regards to being an informed um, creationist is about dealing with the scientific literature. I want to kind of zoom in on that maybe just yeah. a little bit because because that can be a an arduous task like yes. even if you're like for me right like i'm a lot more i keep going back to johnny in the pew right okay i'm a lot right. more interested in creationism than johnny in the pew but it's still hard for me to make it through That's a journal article a scientific technical journal article where i'm just like so far away from from understanding exactly what all is going on there and it's like it's almost like the best i could hope to do without a lot more context than that is to just repeat what they're saying without right. being able to to question it with integrity. Side note, this is kind of one of the reasons why um, I'm almost more interested in doing something like, you know, okay, oh, it was Chad Arment who authored that paper I was yeah. thinking of. I'm almost more interested in something like having him on and That's then correct. somebody who maybe would have a different perspective or something. And like, Let's hear you guys talk about it and see, and, and let, let's all understand together, you know, where, where you're coming from kind of thing. So, um, uh, and, but I don't know if that's going to be the answer for everybody. So, you know, the, the kind of the note that you wrote down here, which I think is helpful is you said that an informed creationist is going to have some competency in navigating and summarizing of scientific literature. So I guess if you want to expand on that, that'd yeah. be really helpful. But then also just kind of tell us like, how do you do that? How do you get better yeah, at that? That's right. Yeah, well, let me back up a little bit because I think this actually helps frame uh, what, you know, what we're doing when we try to engage with scientific literature. And, and that's it goes back to what you were just saying a few minutes ago, you know, just understand the nature of science. As Christians, I think that we should have a high view of science. Uh, I think that the, uh, the dominion mandate to, sub, to have dominion, subdue, rule the earth, that carries with it the idea of you are going to understand the earth. You are going to have knowledge about it. You're going to accomplish that discovery. And through that, we know from other scripture like Romans 1 and Psalm 19, we are going to be proclaiming God's glory. And so that's why right off the bat, I think we should avoid an anti-science mindset as an informed creationist mm -hmm. uh, and recognize, no, science is actually a, a very, it's not everything, but it is an important part of why God made humans to begin with. Why did God lock so much information and knowledge, things to be known into creation other than because he wanted us to discover it and learn something that would glorify him. And so I think we should have a high view of science, but we also need to recognize that you know, we are fallen. And so science being a human, it represents human knowledge and human discovery. It's, it's always going to have the element of uncertainty, of fallibility. Yes, sometimes even uh, decep uh, deception. You, there have been frauds in yeah. science. It's not the norm it's not something we should use tactically and just if i don't like it it's a fraud uh that's uh, not a good way to reason no uh, no it, it it really isn't uh but but recognizing that we are fallible the science does change um and I, i'll mention this if we get to kind of some resources maybe uh but a book that i really re highly recommend anyone who wants to really 
engage with uh, creationism at this level is Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, uh, which goes what you were saying previously about just how science is all about change. And that's really what Kuhn demonstrates is that science is a uh, science progresses through revolutions where old models, old theories, old paradigms are thrown out and new ones are set in place. And what's helpful about that model of thinking about science is that it, with creation, we actually have two paradigms proceeding in parallel because uh, creation is not replacing the evolutionary paradigm, but it's, it's proceeding in parallel to it, dealing with many of the same data and many of the same uh, tools as well. Uh, which is going to you know, play into our question about literature because creationists write scientific literature yeah. as well. Uh, I mean, so we use many of these same tools, but we have a, a different set of uh, presuppositions that we use to kind of order our thoughts about the data. And that also determines the kinds of questions that we ask. And that's something that Kuhn brings out really, uh, really well in, in, in structure is that uh, scientists solve puzzles which their paradigm tells them are going to be solvable. They'd be hard, but they're solvable. And as creationists, yeah. we should embrace that. Uh, our model, our paradigm tells us that there are certain puzzles. A, a great one um, that you might want to talk about with a, a physicist is the flood heat problem, right? Yeah. Way too much energy being outputted during the flood. What happened to all that energy? How do we explain that? It's a problem. It's a hard problem, but our paradigm tells us it should be solvable. There should be a way to to resolve that problem. And so, it, and that's one of the harder ones actually, but it's, it's one that's worth thinking about and considering. Yeah. Other problems though about, you know, how did God, you know, in creation week form, you know, the planets and such. Now we might be dealing with things that in our paradigm might not be solvable at all. And so the, yeah. the paradigm really is important in determining, you know, and, and this just goes again to how we think about science, that it is not something that is, you know, there's one, it's, it's a single objective truth or standard about the, the universe. It's not, it's very human. It's very social. Uh, something that Kuhn brings out again really well. Science very, has a, a, a lot more in common with social movements, with social revolutions um, than we commonly think of it because we tend to think of lab coats and microscopes. It's interesting. Things yeah. that are objective. And it really isn't that way. It's very human. And I think that's a good thing. If we recognize it, it's a bad thing when we mistake what science is and treat it with a level of, of deference that it doesn't always deserve, but it's healthy when we think of it as this is a, a constantly changing representation of how we understand as humans, the world that God made and what's happened in that world since God made it, you know, understanding historical science. Um, so I think that that's, that is it's just a good background to have when we're dealing with reading literature and trying to follow arguments because this really plays into reading a technical paper, right? Um, understanding what paradigm this author is operating from. And there are, you know, models and sub paradigms you could say within creation and knowing yeah. that is going to help you understand, okay, what is this author trying to do? And that's important because we're, we're trying to separate what's the data and what's the interpretation. What's actually in the ground versus what is this person, you know, speculating or theorizing based on that? And that interpretation is usually going to be governed by a paradigm or a model that that writer or that researcher is operating under. And so knowing what the paradigms are, both broadly in creation and then what the other like positions on the flood boundary and so, post flood boundary and so forth. If you don't know what those are, if you're if you're kind of unplugged from that, then you could read a paper like Chad's. And not necessarily understand why this matters. Or right. I, I was at the ICC in 2018 and uh, Steve Austin, this preeminent creation geologist, gave a, a, in my opinion, a riveting talk on mud deposition. Um, and the very first question he got at the end of the talk was, why? What, 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 why is this important? Um, mm. And, you know, yeah. no fault of the listener. She just wasn't operating under what Steve Austin was trying to do. He was trying to explain the dominant rock type in the rock record. Um, but that wasn't her model. That wasn't her paradigm. She's hearing, you know, a pretty well-known creation scientist talk about mud for an hour. And so, yeah, you know, it, it, there is a level of, you know, if you just jump right into trying to break down technical literature and you don't understand something about what uh, 
what model and what paradigm is is uh, the author is working from, you might not always grasp the significance of what they're talking about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's because like, I, I sometimes I watch like I'm in a note taking and stuff. And so like I'm, I remember this one time I was watching this guy like, you know, it was kind of like a study with me session kind of thing. And I was watching it and I was like, you like, how is this guy awake right now? I'm like, what, what is he reading? It's like, gosh, it's just awful. But when you think about that, that's it's the same reason why I can read a, a piece of technical literature about something theological and I'm a lot more excited about it because that's that's where I live, right? I I mostly care about the theological angle and the and the biblical studies angle of, of things. Which reminds me, I think I might have missed that point. I'm not sure if there's anything more that you wanted to say um, about that, but you, know, you you talk you have a point here about the theological underpinnings of of young earth creationism and at Take all the time you'd like to, to kind of share what you meant by that, too. <laughs> yeah, that honestly, you've covered that whole topic area really well in, in the past, and it'll, no, it'll be nothing new to you. Uh, but I think it's important um, as part of that's why I put it first in my list because I think it's very important for a informed creationist to recognize that the reason why creationism matters ultimately is theological. It's not because the evolutionists are wrong about Lucy. Uh, it's not because, you know, we have a different understanding of the fossil record. The reason why it matters is we, we could say biblical authority, but I think that's not specific enough. Uh, yeah. The reason why it really matters is because um, there are certain theological ideas that come out of Genesis, but you can trace them through all of Scripture. And if you start monkeying, no pun intended, uh, with <laughs> those ideas, um, with, with those strands, you start to unravel uh, the Bible's entire storyline. And the, the three mm -hmm. that I always go to, and you maybe could add your own to these, but uh, the three big ones are that they're historical Adam, that there wasn't a, a real Adam, and that he was, this is the important one, that he was actually the progenitor. He was the father of all the human race. Uh, that is clearly what Paul thinks when you get to Romans, and that's, that reflects that into Christ as the last Adam. And so you mess with that, and you are messing with Christology. And that's not something you do lightly. Um, yeah. And then another one would be the fall, the, the idea that the fall was cosmic, that it affected all of creation, which also ties into Paul's theology in, in Romans. And, and, and you find it in Revelation as well. Um, I like Peter Williams. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you read his, his paper, uh, No Agony Before Adam. Uh, he'd be a great person to give for the podcast, by the way. Uh, but he wrote yeah. an excellent paper arguing that not just human death and not even just animal death, but that, there, that the fall was what brought on what he defines as agony sort of senseless, needless pain that all of creation suffers and experiences in different ways. And that's really what Paul is talking about when he speaks of how all the all creation is groaning. And that is something that's the result of sin. And if you flip that order around, which pretty much every non-young earth model has to do, uh, you're really messing again with some really important New Testament and Old Testament theology. And the last one that I usually, so the, my big three, uh, would then be uh, that there was global judgment at the time of the flood. And I think that, yeah. reflects, that reflects on eschatology because the flood is used as a model. And not even, uh, you had that interview with Justin uh, Burlett. Um, it's not even just judgment, but recreation, uh, which yeah. is also reflected in eschatology, that there is judgment, but it, out of the judgment comes a new heaven and new earth. There is a restoration yeah. that's happening through uh, God's judgment and that judgment again is worldwide and, and maybe even cosmic uh, if, if we if we you know want to go that yeah. far. So those are that's all that's all theology and that doesn't involve any science yeah. at all. So understanding yeah. that I think gives a it gives a durability to your to your um your affirmation of creation right because it's not based on I thought that you know they told me about this about that rock layer and it wasn't true. You know, that some creationist said this thing and it didn't pan out. That's not really where creationism, and that's that creationism's persistence, I think. And whether people realize it or not, the reason why young earth creationism just won't go away, why it persists, especially even at the popular, you know, the lay level, you might say, is because it's, theolog it's theological. Because yes, a lot of right. Christians recognize if I give this up, I'm giving up something really important to my faith. And you know, to their yeah. credit, most, a lot of Christians are not willing to do that. And so yeah. having that up yeah. is just helpful, I think, in, in putting the science into perspective, because the science is what we're really thinking about here. We haven't gone to your, your, your reading technical literature, I have a question yet, 
Um, but, but understanding, okay, I, I'm operating actually from a higher level here than the science uh, that is really giving um, uh, the, the, the durability to my, my creationist convictions. And you know, not all creationists look at it that, that way. I understand that there's presuppositional, there's evidential, there's different models Very of apologetics. Average. And so I understand that. But the, the, I think that regardless of how you get there, there has to be a recognition that there is real core theological truth bound up in the young earth position. And yeah. ultimately, that's why I think we are right to hold on to it, even if some some scientific issues might not always be as clear as we would like. Well, th well, this is, in my opinion, the largest strength of yeah. young age creationism. <laughs> uh, is you know, I mean, it sounds kind of trite, um, or maybe even a little offensive to some groups to say, well, it, the reason why it's it it's the right is because it's biblical. Uh, and I know, like a lot of people get mad at you know saying things like biblical creation and all of right. that. And, you know, and I even try to stay away from that just because I, you know, I, it, I realize that some people don't like it because they think, wow, well, my position can be biblical too. Here's right. the thing, you know, it's the old, it's the old axiom in the medical, uh, medical community. You know, look, if you hear hoofbeats, um, you should probably be looking for a horse, not a zebra. Um, and I think it's interesting that, um, and when you said Peter Williams, did you mean uh, it's somebody different than Peter J. Williams, or are we talking about the same person? Uh, in Cambridge, Tyndale. Yeah. House? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. So, so um, have you read his book, Can We Trust the Gospels? Yes. yes. Yeah. Fantastic book. book. Fantastic book. And so, probably one of the best. Like, anybody can read that book and, like, get it and get why yes. it matters. It's because of the approach he takes. And the approach he takes in that book, for any of you who haven't read it, is basically like, okay, look, you could zoom in to any one of these individual little pieces and you could craft very uh, complex convoluted even detailed uh theories for how these individual pieces work but at the end of the day what you're going to then end up with if you zoom out is you're going to you know you're going to look at you're going to look down at what you've got in front of you and you've got just all these little individual things that don't really make sense together that you've posited in order to explain these little nuances. Whereas if you just take the one simple proposition that the reason why what is written is written is because that's what happened. It solves all of those conundrums. They all go right. away. And I look at creationism in the same vein. In fact, I should probably write about this sometime. Um, I look at creationism the same way. Sure. Like, maybe there are some things that you can do to, like, explain away this, that, and the other little nuance of what the Bible says in various places. I think about, you know, I mean, my goodness, you could have a, a couple of them, you know, like one of Mark 10, 6, the whole Mark 10, 6 thing where people talk about um, creationists make the point that Jesus said, well, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And there's whole sorts of technical biblical arguments people going back and forth on if that could really mean that and are we going to take his okay fine like yes we should be precise we should like argue the little details too but like again that's just one data point that just makes sense without any further appealing to greek verb tenses and whatever else not that that stuff doesn't matter because it does but again if you just look at it in the overall paradigm the problem just goes away the flood is another one of these, okay? When it comes to the flood, in order to explain whatever other little pet theological thing they have or a scientific idea that they want to make room for, you know, they'll posit things like a local flood or a tranquil flood or just, you know, this, this tight little regional flood. And it's like, okay, I see what you did there. Maybe you could get away with it. Like, like one scholar who I, I, I deeply appreciate his work is, is Mike Kaiser. But he's made this whole big deal about how you could easily argue. I, I should air quote this. Uh, and for those listening via audio, I'm air quoting. You could easily argue for a local flood from the Bible itself by just taking the table of nations of Genesis 10. And then, you know, you could say, well, well, since that's the only you know things that were mentioned, then it seems to restrict the scope of the flood to only these nations. And it could be bigger than that. But like, you're not committed to a view that's bigger than that. But then. Ah, there's that pesky little inconvenient thing in the New Testament where multiple writers seem to make an illusion between a worldwide universal judgment, compare it to the flood, and what do you do with that? So again, it's, it's very important, I think, for people to realize and, and to underscore this point that 
young age creationism, the reason, to your point, why it won't go away is because it just seems to be the biblical view that is this one hypothesis, if you will, that very clearly explains many, many data points, and it does so very simply. And I'll just underscore that with one more observation that I, um, I think it's, it's obvious now that I know it, but like the first person I heard to articulate this to give credit where it's due is um, Doug Harold. Doug and his wife, Lindsay, are very active in the creation oh, yeah. community and just fantastic people. I love them. So wonderful. And Doug um, made the point that like young age creationism is the only view where you can actually go ahead and look at those specifics and, and you could actually argue from the text of the Bible for an age of the earth. And if you do, this is the view you come up with. At best, the other views could be massaged and, and molded and, and made to fit by somehow saying things like, oh, well, we, the, the, the genealogies must not be real numbers. It must be some sort of ancient, you know, cipher or some sort of, you know, whatever, like ancient Sumerian king lists, you know, this and making these comparisons. You could do things like that to, in a sense, sort of dodge what, what the argument, you know, what you would actually derive from actually just reading the scriptures. But it's like young age creationism is, creationism is the only view that you can make a positive biblical case for, not just fit it into your model. And so I do, I just wanted to underscore that partially because I'm nerdy about the theology, but also just because of how much it matters. Um, that, that the, yeah, like we, we spend time uh, thinking about the science because we truly think it's the biblical view. Not, not just that, not just that the Bible is compatible with this science that we're doing, but that the Bible legitimately teaches that this is the way the world is and the way the world was. And so now we're doing science to figure out what on earth that looked like. So I figure, yep. I, f I feel like that's, um, that's very, very important. Absolutely. I think the phrase that Peter Williams uses is uh, reading the evidence against the grain. Uh, describe that. Yes, you can look at every individual point and come up with a, another way. And I won't even say explain it away necessarily. It can be a legitimate, okay, the grammar, it could be. Sure. But when yeah. you have to keep doing that over and over again, and you have a constellation of things, uh, uh, you know, where sometimes you're, you're embracing, you know, a whole uh, you inconsistent or at least divergent uh, hermeneutics for different passages. It's, you read it this yeah. way in this text and that way in another. Um, it's that it, you're, you're not really doing justice to what the text is trying to tell you. That's, that's yeah. why it's complicated. And, uh, and I think the same thing goes yeah, when we start to move it back into the science realm. Um, you know, and I don't know if you, uh, you probably have engaged some of with, um, the ideas of, uh, Josh Womadas, who is by the way, a local here in St. Louis at Washington it's university. Okay. Yeah. I, I think he's a great guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, his, his ideas, while you could argue that there, there's an element of plausibility there that he makes, um, they open a lot of theological cans of worms, cans of theological worms. Uh, yes. I mean, want to take that analogy, uh, yeah. when he starts to suppose there's people outside the garden and there's intermarriage going on and apparently god's image is being imparted through intermarriage and not through creation which you, you you've got you know people that were yeah. uncondemned animals one day and then now their children are condemned because but they had the, the unfortunate they had the misfortune of having a a a actual god created human uh, as a as a as another parent so yeah, yeah. Let, let me it, just, and, and, and I want you to finish that thought, but let me just break in here because this is one yeah. of the a pet peeve with him uh, <laughs> specifically is, is because he does seem like a great guy and I, I'm sure he is, but he almost has a little bit of the, I call it Jack Sparrow syndrome um, that, uh, the, uh, that the new atheists really yes. capitalized on. Oh. Um, I, I, when I think about this, I always think of the image of, of Chris Hitchens, you know, walking around on, on a stage with, you know, with his, uh, whatever he was drinking his whiskey or whatever. You know, and basically just idea of like, oh, move along. There's nothing to see here. Yes, yeah, I'm cool. we can all get along. We can all be friends. Peace. You know, it's just that, and it's like you're actually you're actually opening the door to some. I know you're trying to be nice, and you're like trying to pass it off as like this is no big deal. There's really nothing to see here. I only needed to write a whatever 300 page book or whatever it is to talk about it. But there's really nothing to see here. We don't need, you know. And it's like there's obviously something to see here because these again these cans of worms keep getting opened as a result of these uh, of these thoughts and these ideas so I, I i think it was worth taking a pause there to say like anytime somebody writes a 300 page book i don't know how many pages it is i'm just but it's a full you know it's a regular book right 
I'm like, hey, time somebody writes a 300 page book that says, move along. There's really nothing to see here. Um, stop, evaluate. That's not true. It's just not going to be the case. So anyway, it's good. All right, cool. So, um, um, let's. I, I interrupted you. Did you have? Did you want to finish your thought? No, no. I think that that's. I, I think we uh, we said what needed to be said there. I, I still have an answer to your question about reading literature. Um, so I don't know if you want to go into that or, or we can move on to something else. So how? Go, go go for it, and then we'll move on. Okay. So I'll I'll, I'll mention. I think it, it'll play nicely into some other things we might want to conclude with. Um, so yeah, it, one of the important things I think in kind of moving into this informed creationist tier, if you want to put it that way, um, is being able to read technical literature and at, at that includes creationist literature, but I would say that's not all of it. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's helpful to be more widely read than that. Um, and you can get a lot, by the way, when you're reading technical li literature, you can get a lot by reading abstracts, especially if it's not a paper. So typically a technical, you know, article is going to have some summary paragraph. Uh, that gives you an overview of the paper and its conclusions. Um, when I'm reading a, a paper, especially if it's not one where I have a lot of familiarity with the subject and I, I'm going to get lost in the math, um, I'll read the abstract and then I'll kind of skim down to the conclusions. Um, so typically a, a well-ordered paper is going to give you an abstract, going to give you some discussion or some, it's going to give you what they actually did, right? Whether that was some genetic study or doing something with a telescope or field research, what have you. Um, and then you, at the conclusion is where they will kind of, you, if again, if it's a well-written paper, uh, it should tell you, okay, here's, here's, here's the significance of what we found. And then there might be a results or discussion, uh, that follows that. Um, again, it's going to vary from journal to journal, subject area to subject area. Uh, but you don't always have to read the entire paper if it's, if it's completely, you know, not your cup of tea. Um, yeah. one thing it's helpful, I'll just get, give a, a side note. It's, it is helpful to have a focus area. Um, if you're going to start doing this, um, you, don't, you, 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 you can only really consume technical literature uh, in a certain breadth of it, um, unless, especially if it's not your full-time job. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's geology. Uh, and so I can read papers on stratigraphy and sedimentology and I can, I can follow them pretty well because I've, I've been reading that kind of literature for a few years now. And so it's, I've acclimated to the, the, the lingo and, and so forth. And that does take time. So you can, uh, get away with reading abstracts. Um, for, for some things and in creationist literature in particular. So there's a number of journals and hopefully most of the listeners are familiar with them, but the obvious ones would be answers research journal, which is put up by AIG journal of creation, which is uh, CMI. Um, there's this creation, creation research society quarterly, uh, which is also a, a pretty, uh, well-respected journal in, in creation circles. There's also, uh, the, uh, journal on. Uh, it's what's kind of an awkward name. Journal of Creation, Theology, and, and Science. Uh, a little bit more obscure. It's um, You can find it on the Core Academy website, uh, coresci.org. You could probably put these links in show notes, I'm sure. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, so these are, are places where you will you, you'll find technical literature written by creationists. And this is really where a lot of the rubber meets the road because this is where you're going to start reading creationists that differ with each other. And you know, kind of going back to the whole issue of how do we articulate and communicate, you know, this is where you're going to start reading people arguing different positions and in some cases rebutting each other, replying to each other. And it's really helpful, I think, uh, when you're when you're reading technical literature to try to try to get an awareness of, OK, where does this is there a conversation going on here? Um, you know, for example, there's mm -hmm. um, uh, there is have been a couple of uh, forums. I think these were published out of the Journal of Creation originally on questions like the post-flood boundary or the Green River Formation, which is a uh, formation in, U in Utah and Wyoming that kind of plays, not Utah, Wyoming, which kind of plays into the, the whole flood boundary debate. And there was actually written by two different researchers uh, going back and forth. And it's in a context. It's, it's like there's a initial paper and then a reply and there's, they go back and forth. It's a great series. It's a, it's a great example of scientific debate really happening. Um, yeah. And so... When you're when you're reading scientific literature, uh, it is, a, a, and you're thinking of okay, how am I am I going to communicate this to an audience, right? Um, you you want to have an understanding of you don't want to just take you know one side essentially and say okay, here's a creationist say because I found a creationist saying it. Um, when there could be an act that could be an active area of debate among creationists, and they're going to go yeah. to another, even a mainstream ministry and hear a very different view. It's something as simple as what how was the Grand Canyon formed. Um, you know, depending on what article you read, 
uh, you're going to come away with one position and then you might be surprised to discover, no, there's actually a sizable number of creationists that differ with that. And so, um, you know, that's, that, that's, it comes with the territory and it, it does take some, some, some effort because, you know, if, if you're just watching the DVDs and hearing presentations and reading, you know, the various popular level magazines and such, you're going to mostly get one perspective and you're probably not going to get, you know, a sense that this is actually a matter of debate, even among, among creationists. And so that's why I really do, rec I, I strongly recommend that creationists that do want to speak and, and do podcasts and do writing and such, and really be part of communicating this information, know what the journals are, um, know what some of the, the major uh, debates in creation are, and then make sure that not that you need to communicate all that detail to an audience, but I think to temper some of our statements and our conclusions, right? Instead of pointing, mm -hmm. you know, some of the really famous fossil fo photographs uh, that we like to show, here's an example of fossilization happening during the flood. Well, some of those are actually from layers that a lot of creation geologists don't think are from the flood. Um, and so, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's still an example of rapid burial. So it's still a, a nice thing to talk about, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I'm, that I, I am personally very interested in. Of course, I'm, I'm talking about something close to my art, that's geology. Um, but the, the other disciplines have, have similarities. If you're talking about cosmology and how to understand redshift or dark matter or dark energy, right? Understand. Oh, yeah. That. Just actually, you know, some are okay with that, some aren't. And if we come out swinging and saying dark matter is a, you know, an invention for the Big Bang Theory, for one thing, that's actually not correct. Um, but also, it doesn't really represent, you know, it's not any sort of consensus among creation astronomers. So understanding, you know, where yeah. those... Uh, disagreements might be or where there might be, um, you know, areas of uncertainty. It, it just, it's helpful in both our own enlightenment, our own understanding of the issue, but it also helps keep us from making statements that might be misleading or that might, you know, lead people to some conclusion that is going to not serve them well, you know, going forward. Um, and so it, it, it's, it, it's, it is not, there's no <laughs> silver bullet. Uh, you can, I mean, you can, I, I guess, and well, now there is, because you could always type it in chat GPT and ask them for a summary. Um, it's but true. Yeah. I literally did that. So I wanted a quick summary of uh, Thomas Kuhn's book that I mentioned earlier. I've read it yeah. a couple times, but it's been a while. I asked chat GPT, hey, give me a summary. Give me a nice one. Um, so so you, can, you can cheat that way sometimes. But for the most part, uh, there is no substitute for, you know, subscribing to these journals um, or and this is something I was going to mention later on, but I'll just start it now so we can kind of close this this topic. Um, you know, there's some really helpful uh, research databases for creationists that are out there. Uh, one of them is the Creation Evolution Literature Database, uh, KELD, which is uh, hosted by uh, Todd Wood and the Core Academy website. And then the other one is a Research Assistance Database, um, which is on the creationeducation.org website. And uh, I'll give you those links so you can put them in the show notes. But both yes, of these please. are excellent tools for you can type in a formation or a fossil or i don't know supernova whatever it is some topic you're interested in and it will search uh a, both both these sites search different databases and so each of them are, are kind of major on one thing or another so you use both um but they will pull up um uh lists of publications uh both technical and popular um and they'll usually if possible they'll give you the abstract um, so you can get a quick sense of, okay, what is this paper arguing for? It's a great way to find out what different creationists have written in the past on, you know, some particular topic. Um, and, and Keld in particular is cool because you can filter by, you know, what journal you're looking at and author names, things like that. Um, so yeah. those are, are tools that I highly recommend uh, people be aware of. They're kind of, a, they're kind of nerdy, you know, and this is, I think this is a nerdy sure. podcast. Um, Oh but yeah, really helpful for tracking down. I mean, there's there's creation publications that have gone offline, and you know you can't subscribe to them anymore, but they're still good information. And so you know, knowing knowing uh, what avenues we have available to to go and find that, and you know, pull up some histories. Uh, what if what if what a creationist thought over time? That's a really qu a great uh, question I like to ask when I'm looking at a certain topic. You know, it, can I put some history together? Can I see how creationist thought has maybe uh, evolved? over time on this issue because that's going to help you better nice. understand <laughs> uh, that's going to help you better understand you know the current debate on a certain topic as well yeah 
I think everything you've said is just so helpful and so extremely important. We'll definitely put all those links there. Um, yeah, because you, you, you kind of want to figure out how to go to the next level, but without being like totally overwhelming, because like you said, like we all have jobs, we all have lives. And it's like, where do I even start? Let me just underscore from, um, from the marketing world and, and, um, which is where I, I sort of come from. Um, that's uh, the two things I'm nerdy about the most are creation and marketing. Um, and so I, I find often a lot of um, uh, similarity in the sense that a lot of what you see going on in public, um, in just in public life, you can see people being marketed to, and it's kind of interesting. Um, but the the idea of basically choosing a focus area, in my world, we call that choosing a niche. And it's really so important that I feel like it needs to be underscored. I just can't be an effective geology, theology, astronomy, guy like i just i don't have time i don't have you know the interest i mean if i had lots of like supporters and i was in a ministry full time and it was my job to do that maybe but even so i frankly think i would probably take the ken ham approach and just like you know have somebody who was a specialist in one area on my staff and a specialist in another area you know because i think and that's how science works that's that's the thing that people don't really seem to realize it's like when you when you meet somebody who's a phd in that area I know in creationism, we often like, I don't know, we sort of like people with a PhD, we sort of like hold them as like this level, like they even introduce themselves as, oh, I'm this PhD scientist because they realize that that has some sway with people. Well, again, in the world of science, like a PhD is hyper specialized on one hyper specialized ultra niche discipline of one category within, you know, three other categories that are still larger than it. And, and so it's like, it's not the end all be all. Um, it, it does help, of course. I mean, having a PhD is a fantastic thing, and having any kind of higher education is a fantastic thing. But you don't need that stuff um, to to be to be effective. I do think choosing an area of focus, especially if you're going to do any popularization at all. Okay, and this is for for me. This is the um um. Again, the mistake, if I could say, that I made back in 2017 when I, I started my creation podcast and then I, um, I, I chose to get out of that niche and just go more broad, uh, even though we talked about a lot of similar stuff. It just that, just that doing that one thing harmed my impact with the ministry because we were really starting to see some good growth and starting to get the message of being a winsome creationist, even though I didn't call it that at the time, out to more people. And then I just sort of stunted that growth by, failing to stay in my lane. And so that's sort of why, one reason why I started the Winsome Creationist again is just because I feel like just being a Winsome Creationist, sadly at the moment, is a niche. I'm not going to lie. I hope I put myself out of business. I do. I really don't think there should have to be a podcast pretty much dedicated to, hey, how do we talk about this without slicing each other's throats? And, and literally, like around the same time that I uh, start this podcast, here we go. Answers in Genesis comes out with this series, this this long running series of articles, literally with more infighting, even inside of the young age creationist community. And I'm like, well, looks like I'm gonna have a job for a while. So here we are. We're on a we're on a niche podcast about literally how to be nice and be a creationist at the same time. But but it is. It's like if you're gonna popularize, I think of um um uh, what's his name? Peter Brummel's uh, Paleo Logos. It's like he's got a a channel on YouTube where Again, he's he's staying in his lane. He's like he's got this one thing that he's really interested in. He's he's nerdy about it, and I'm sure you could have a fantastic conversation with Peter about theology or about something else. But he's just really interested in human anthropology, and it's like if you want to learn about human anthropology with respect to creation, then that's where you should go. And I really love uh, kind of that whole idea. The more people that we get becoming informed creationists, look. The water's fine and there's plenty of room. Start you a YouTube channel. Start you a podcast. Seriously, hyper specialize in something. Have guests on that are only related to that thing. You know, be because it's I think it's so cool that we that we can have a, a larger community of, of of creationists interested in their own thing and being effective in their own thing versus only having a little bit of knowledge uh, in certain areas. And yep. uh, um, you know, one of the things that. I just wanted to say to underscore that as well is I, I, I just appreciate you so much um, because I think creationism is just in such good hands 
the, frankly, the more Zacks that come along. It's like the more people who, I mean, I just remember, I think guys like Marcus Ross and, and you and um, just people who are good at giving a public presentation and are nice creationists. Because I promise you, when I first started this, I had so many conversations with people and it just wasn't the norm at all. It was like, especially, especially a few years ago, there was nobody talking in the public sphere about young age creationism who you could listen to without just wanting to, you know, like turn it off. I mean, frankly, and this is why people got turned off and, and, and turned away from it. And so it's really important. It seems so silly and so insignificant, but it's not. It's really important to, to have these conversations in a way that are, um, or in a way that is nice and genuine and frankly, uh, winsome. So um, I think- was, No, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's, oh, it's, that comes out of the, the ultimate apologist passage, right? First Peter 3.15. Yeah. Ready to give an answer with meekness and with fear, and you know there's yeah. an, ele an element of of humility that I think we always have to have because we are humans, we are fallible, our okay. arguments are not always going to be sound. Uh, like I said previously, we will make mistakes at times, um, and I, I think that that's that's something that we just need to individually kind of internalize uh, and and not allow the fact that because you know as even whether you're a PhD or whether you're you know someone who's just you know fairly well read or, or interested in some topic and you you know more than all your neighbors right pride is immediately there right you're immediately telling oh, yeah i'm smarter than you you believe otherwise yeah. because and you know, we don't we won't put it in those terms we're not going to necessarily formulate that idea but that that comes out in our behavior unfortunately i think that's that's why you do see unfortunately kind of a, a history of of maybe you know uncharitable things being said you know by creatius and you know creatius get accused of being divisive anyways, just because of what, what it is we stand for. You're going to have that, but we don't yeah. need to substantiate it through our character and through, you know, a lack of charity and a lack of graciousness, a lack of, of meekness. And most especially, you know, what we're talking about in our own ranks of all places where we should really be recognizing that we have a lot of, so much more in common than, you know, the little divisions we make over, you know, what, which, uh, which animals had, which skin coverings. Oh my um, word. For real, like, and, 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 um, this really kind of puts a good pin in it, like in the sense of, cause you had this thought about the need for humility and Christian ch charity, like that's part of being an informed creationist. And I just want to say like, look, an informed creationist is a winsome creationist that I think I, th I, I don't really think that you can, you can really be, um, one without being the other, at least that you shouldn't be, you yep. should really be an informed and winsome creationist. Neither one of these is is more important than the other, um, because if you're informed, but you are, are you know you're not you have an audience of one, and it's yourself, then who cares, That's right? right? And people people aren't going to listen to somebody who is not winsome. And you you will have certain people who will, in the sense of um, you know people who are sort of dyed in the wool and maybe already have the indoctrination or whatever. But look, I mean, I. You know, I remember when, um, and I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not really a name caller. Like, I don't I call people out or whatever, but like, I think some things are just like a, a public domain enough that, you know, we can talk about them a little bit. You know, and I remember when Ken Ham was speaking at the um, SES uh, conference uh, here in Charlotte, just down the road, um, a few years ago. I and mean, I had a buddy who I was talking to at the time, and he was like, yeah, like, and I was brand new in this game, right? And I would have, but he was literally like, man, I just kind of wish like you were representing creationism there instead of Ken Ham. Oh. And, and, and I was like, well, okay, number one, that's very gracious of you. Like, thank you for saying that, but no way. Um, and, but the second thought was like, wow, like that's how far some people have been pushed away by this attitude that like literally some rando on the internet with a podcast He's like, yeah, like you're a better representative of that. And again, I'm not saying that to my own horn. I'm just saying that like all the only difference is I'm nice. Right. And I'm sure he's nice too. I, I again, this is not a Ken Ham bash fest. I don't I don't mean it to be that way at all. He seems like a super nice guy. But like you can't argue with the fact that he can come across a little abrasive sometimes. And others do as well. And it's like, you know what? If you're just maybe a little bit more winsome, have a little bit more of that Christian charity and just can I communicate your ideas with a little bit more friendliness, maybe you'd have a little bit a bigger audience or at least a little bit more welcoming audience. So, yeah. Yeah. And I just want to say, you know, I've been immensely helped personally by 
Answers to Genesis and Ken Ham's ministry and all of the major creationist ministries. They've been a huge help in many ways. And you know, I think it's always a, a, a risk that, and, and something that applies to the, the form of creationists as well, um, is that you know we, we can develop a bit of tunnel vision and we can start to, uh, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, we, we start to kind of conflate uh, our, our viewpoints and our arguments on certain issues relating to creation or another issue that we're very passionate about. You know, this isn't just a, a creationist problem by any means. Uh, but you see that a lot where certain organizations and ministries develop kind of an outsized impression or view of themselves and their particular focus area. And I think that, and this might be a, a good uh, topic, I think it was in my notes, but I, I kind of missed it, um, but it might be a, a good one to end on anyways. And that's the whole aspect of, of community and yeah. this idea of the body of Christ, uh, that we're not all gifted the same way. By the way, this kind of applies to, I, I did mention this, but, you know, in seeking out, you know, reading technical literature, right? Knowing who is trained in certain disciplines. I mean, that, that should be huge. If you're reading papers about paleontology and there's a paleontologist saying one thing, okay, maybe they're not right, but give them additional weight because they put in the, 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 the effort and, and they develop that expertise. And so we should give them credit in that area. And at the same time, uh, they may not be as, as well suited to, you know, opinionating on some other issue. Right. And, and that's, it's, it's really a, a, a great, a great analogy, I think, between the scientific community and, you know, the church as the body of Christ, as one body with many members, we're not all gifted the same way. We're not all called the, to the same vocations, the same, um, the same ministries and so forth. And that's okay. We don't need to be all inclusive on our own. We're not meant to be that way. We need each other. We need those who are more passionate about this nerdy topic and those who are more given to, you know, maybe, you know, chair or missions or, you know, evangelism, yeah. certain apologetics and others who are in biblical studies and textual criticism. There's so, so many, you know, niche areas where um, our knowledge is frankly not in line with truth and we need to be improving in that area. And we can't do that independently, individually. And being an informed creationist to me really is about recognizing my limitations as much as it is about trying to improve my own competency and my own ability to articulate and communicate clearly. It's also, you know, this idea of um, a epistemic humility, to put a technical term for it, right? A so recognizing yeah. my own knowledge is always going to be limited. I could be wrong and I need people to hold me accountable. I need people who are gifted in other areas to fill in where I'm, I'm weak. And I need to, you know, we, we all need to find our own our place, you know, where, where God's called us. I love how J.P. Moreland calls it our vocation, right? This idea yeah. that not just a calling, it's something that, you know, the, the Lord's going to work in your life in such a way that your thought processes and your, your uh, skills and such are going to kind of revolve around something that, that he's moving you towards. And, and you don't need to be everything. Um, you don't, you, you, we're, we're not supposed to be everything. We can't do that. And in science, it's, that you said about the PhD, right? It's, you know, scientists at high level at high levels are hyper focused and hyper specialized, and they need people with PhDs in very different areas if they're going to have a, a holistic, you know, view of you know the way the world operates in, in this discipline and so forth. And so, yeah. you know, we as as creationists, we need community. We need to know about you know the other ministries that are out there that are maybe not the big three letter acronyms. Uh, we need yeah. to know about you know other gatherings where we can you know, or, or institutions, schools where there are influential uh, creation as professors, um, you know, uh, Core Academy, I've mentioned them before. Um, they run a, a annual creationist retreat, which I've attended a few times. It's incredibly, uh, just a wonderful blessing uh, of, of a gathering. It's, it, there'll be a, some technical topic under discussion, but it's just great to be with people that yeah. are like-minded and that are, are really trying to practice being the body of Christ in the area of creation. And it's, you know, surprise that applies there just as much as it applies to any other area of, of our, our human or our, our Christian life, really. Uh, we yeah. need each other. And that's such an important thing to grasp and something that I think lately, you know, as, you know, big ministries feel like they can do it all themselves and they can snipe at everyone else. And that's, it's not healthy and it's, it's not in keeping, uh, I think, with um, the, the model that, uh, that, God has given us in, in the church. And I think that yeah. uh, we, we can't separate ourselves from that. 
Yeah, it's a total shame um, to, to think that. So I want to circle back to that in just a moment. Um, before I do, because I want to ask you something about, um, about uh, one, of the, one of the creation conferences. But before we do that, um, tell me just a little bit of, you know, where could folks find you? I know you have a podcast. I'm dying to know if you pronounce Missouri, Missouri, um, uh, or not. Uh, but tell us a little bit about where people can find you, about what you do with the Missouri Association for Creation and all of that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So uh, our website is uh, mocreation.org, so mocreation.org. Um, and that is uh, the website for the St. Louis-based organization that I, I do speaking uh, uh, for them, I do some field trips, generally with a geology focus, uh, since that's my, my, my focus area. Um, but we've got guys that are interested in genetics and that are interested in, in um, you know, races, races and, and human uh, origins, things like that. Um, and so there's a, we've got a, a, a nice mix of, of, you know, disciplines that are relate that are uh, reflected in our, our group. And that's actually this going along with this. One of the things that we've been trying to practice in our own organization is, you know, rec is kind of fact checking each other and, and doing a sort of a lightweight version of peer review. Uh, as we prepare presentations and field trips and so forth, uh, just to make sure that, you know, we're, we're uh, hopefully covering each other's uh, weaknesses uh, in, in, in different, different areas. So our group, uh, we meet uh, once a month um, and, um, and we'll usually go through like a series of presentations given by our, our various speakers on, on our, our speakers bureau. Um, and we do have a podcast, uh, Show Me Creation is the name of the podcast. And so there's a few episodes out already. We had a great interview with uh, Marcus Ross, and I believe our next interview is with Dr. Robert Carter from CMI. Um, and so aside from, from that organization, I'm also part of a, a creation conference series, uh, which is called, uh, our website is creationconf, creationconf.com. And we call ourselves Clearly Seen, C Clearly Seen Events is the name of our conference series. Um, and, uh, we should have you out sometime, Steve. I think you'd enjoy it. Cause that's really, we have a, a event coming up here in St. Louis shortly. And, uh, we try to focus on having events that are, uh, that are, you know, a, a positive, a, a model building approach to creation and really just seeing how creation is reflected in a certain topic like astronomy or, uh, in this case, human origins and, and the image of God is actually, um, our, our topic, uh, for this next conference. Um, so that's, that's something that I'm involved in um, mm -hmm. that uh, folks might be interested in. Uh, we do live stream our events. So even if you're not in the city where we happen to be located, uh, you can tune in uh, virtually as well. Um, awesome. That's where you're going to find me as far as uh, most creation circles go. I, I show up at conferences. So if you're at the ICC um, uh, this year uh, or at the Origins meeting or the, the Creation Research Society's annual meeting, um, more, more likely than not, I'm somewhere in the audience, probably in a geology talk. Um, so hopefully I'll have a chance to, to be a lot of people through this. So awesome. Uh, that's fantastic. I will post all the links to, to that stuff. You didn't answer the most important question though. Do you pronounce it Missouri or Missouri? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Well, I pronounce it Missouri, but I am not a local, uh, or a native, I should say. Um, I was, I'm from California originally. Um, a transplant. So, gotcha. Yeah, I'm a transplant. I, I do hear Missouri pronounced occasionally, but I can't think of anybody in our organization that well, no, I, should, I take the back. Our president calls it Missouri. It's kind of subtle, but he, he does he does have that. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, no offense, Marv. Uh, <laughs> love you. But uh, yeah, I call it Missouri. No, I no no offense uh, um, intended at all. I love it. I I, I just I never forget the first time I went out there because we were, um, I think it was with the, with the gospel group I was playing with. We were out in that area. We went to like a rodeo, and I was like, what? What did he just say? What did he just call this place? I didn't understand what they were talking about, uh, so, uh, but it's good. It's good. Um, no, I was just going to, um, I thought it might be apropos as we, as we wrap up here, just to spend a, a, a moment or two talking about the ICC, maybe yeah. just the importance about the ICC since it is coming up this year. Um, it only rolls around every, what, four years or so. So um, I figured if you could just, I know it's not even your thing, but if you just wanted to give maybe a little plug for like why an informed creation, I should consider attending this event and what it's like. Uh, we could do that, and then uh, and then we'll wrap up. Absolutely, that's a that's a great a note to end on. Yeah, so the International Conference on Creationism, it's a running. Uh, I forget when the first one was was held, uh, but it was either late eighties or or early nineties, yep. um, and it's held every four to five years. Uh, it for a long time it was held out in Pittsburgh, um, and it was uh, hosted by a creationist group in that area. 
It's recently moved to Cedarville, Ohio. It's now under the uh, the stewardship of Cedarville University, which is a very solid young earth uh, institution. And so, yeah, it, it's it's a fantastic event. And it's, yeah, speaking as far as you know, the informed creationists would be remiss not to at least try to uh, make it to to the ICC. It's essentially a a large research summit. Um, so you can have a lot of folks who have worked on research projects related to creation. There'll be things related to theology and, and maybe even some archaeology, Bible chronology, questions like that that relate to creation. And uh, I've only attended one actually myself. I, I, I watched a, a very rudimentary live stream of the 2013 conference. And then in 2018, I was able to go in person for the first time. It is overwhelming, especially if you're a first timer. There's a lot going on, a lot of content going on in parallel. There's a lot of folks having engaging conversations in the hallway that you'll want to stop in and listen in on. Um, and one of the great things about the ICC is that all of the papers that are presented, they are uh, made available in the conference proceedings. Um, they used to have a published volume. I believe they don't do that anymore. It'll be digital. But you'll be able to read you know, the, the papers and, 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 and uh, catch up on stuff you miss because you'll miss a lot. Uh, you, you're going to have to just yeah. set. Uh, get get used to that. Just uh, choose the the, er the areas that kind of pertain to your your uh, interest area. There's going to be a lot of dialogue over some somewhat controversial topics in creation. We mentioned the post flood boundary discussion a couple times in this conversation. There's going to be, uh, I believe, some uh, in depth uh, uh, dialogue over that topic and and other topics in creation as well. So it's 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 often a it can be a a really consequential meeting. A lot of uh, important uh, presentations are given, important conversations are had, and there's usually a mixture of things that are very technical and things that are a little more approachable. So, um, you know, your your mileage may vary on that. I don't know how it's going to work uh, at Cedarville this year, but I know in uh, the last yeah. one in Pittsburgh, they actually made it a point to have some entry level presentations for folks who might be newer to the to uh, to the event. So it's an excellent conference. Cedarville is an excellent institution. So I'm very happy to see uh, ICC having a, a home there. And yeah, absolutely recommend folks uh, make it out there if they can. It's going to be a, a great time. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's amazing. All right. Well, Zach, man, it's just been such a pleasure. This has been a great conversation. I think um, by the end of this talk, hopefully you are convinced that you should be a winsome and informed creationist. Right. Um, and uh, I, man, like I'll just say to you as a, a note of encouragement, I mean, I love what you're doing. I think you should develop this maybe even into some sort of a, a uh, a model of of some sort. Um, I I many years ago when I first got into this, I had this dream to create a essentially a membership website that would that would help you know kind of, kind of teach people um, how to do this. You know how, how to how to kind of become an informed gracious. I didn't have that language for it, um, but um, I uh, you know I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm always thinking about something. So I'm not not making any promises or anything, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that at at some point it crossed my mind that maybe I need to resurrect that project. And I think if I ever do, you can expect me to ring your phone asking you to teach something on it and being an informed creationist because I think you should keep developing this model. And it's um it's fantastic. So uh, kudos to you and thank you for the work that you're doing and for the message that you're spreading. And I just uh, I hope that you get to spread this farther and wider. Uh, than ever as the days go by. So God bless and thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. It's been great.